Welcome back, everybody, for another awesome chapter in our family communication textbook. Um, chapter five is a really great way to look back at chapter two and really appreciate all of the awesome things that we learned in chapter two. Um, as I've said before, I know that chapter two can be a really challenging one initially to read, um, and that's why we spent that extra week on it. Um, however, now that uh, we read chapter five, you can really see the threads of chapter two um, um, through this chapter and the various theories that we learn in it. And chapter five's um, discussion of intimacy is incredibly unique because it takes these everyday communication practices that we engage in with our family members and others around us um, in order to build and maintain our relationships with them. And it really takes that, that level, that dimension of intimacy and studies it on a more personalized and in-depth level. So let's go ahead and jump in and learn not only what intimacy is, but we're also going to discuss self-disclosure, and we're also going to discuss the various ways in which intimacy can be impacted by other variables such as gender and culture. So um, let's, as we always do, let's kind of start off by defining what we're working with. And so um, one of the biggest things we have to remember is that intimacy is incredibly important in families. And um, I know that we use the word intimacy in our everyday language. Um, please note that when it is used here in the context of communication studies, what we're really talking about when we talk about intimacy is this ability um, or this feeling between families of relational closeness right um and so that relational closeness, this intimacy, um, is built through communication, is maintained through communication. And your textbook opens up by talking about how we all engage in something that actually um, uh, uh, is maintained, is, is uh, that we all are already familiar with, which is everyday talk. Um, and it seems very superficial sometimes, and it seems very um, uh, not impactful in our everyday lives, but we need this idea of everyday talk, this everyday mundane communication, such as how was your day? Um, how are you feeling? What's going on? What's your work week looking like? And those kind of um, what we see as mundane or everyday or boring forms of communication are the first step in creating and maintaining maintaining intimacy within the family and within relationships between you and other people. And it really says a lot about your intimacy and your level of relational satisfaction because your ability to create everyday talk with someone speaks to your ability um, uh, to be able to have those conversations with that person and also speaks to your desire to show that you care about them um, and their desire to show that they care about you. And so intimacy ultimately is revealed and developed and maintained through relationships Relationship with both verbal and nonverbal communication behaviors. And so it's so important that we put communication at the central point of all of this. Communication really is um, the biggest piece of uh, how we develop intimacy um, overall. So let's move on to what we know about intimacy and closeness. Um, just like I said on the last slide with intimacy, make sure that when you read the word closeness in my slides or in the textbook or online on Canvas, that you understand that the word closeness here refers to um, this uh, a communication studies based definition of a high level of mutual knowledge and influence, a sense of dependability in the relationship, mutual devotion, sharing commitment, and long-term timeline, um, ultimately having a strong desire to be interactive with the other person. And so I know that we use the word closeness in everyday um, colloquial language, but make sure that you understand what the word closeness, as I put here in red for a reason, um, what it means in the context of our course and in the context of communication studies. And so really what we strive for is to understand this dimension of closeness um, and the level of which any family might um, achieve that closeness um, and where they're at on the spectrum of closeness. Um, and really, it represents, most importantly, the family member's acceptance of their interdependence. What that means is that um, if your family has uh, high levels of closeness or there is that feeling of closeness in your family or in any given family, what we know then as family communication studies scholars is that they recognize that they need one another. They recognize this interdependence that they have with one another. And ultimately, that recognition leads to um, what we call presence and family intimacy. Intimacy. Presence refers to this willingness to be there for someone else. And of course, being there means physically being there. So that can mean a parent attending a child's 
you know, um, sports games or PTA meetings or what have you, but it could also mean being there emotionally and cognitively for someone, right? Being there emotionally for someone when they're having a really hard time, being there cognitively for someone when they're trying to resolve their own problem and you're there trying to think that problem through with them to help them. Um, and ultimately, when these things are present, we have what we call family intimacy, this sense of family commitment and devotion to one another that is shared between all family members. So now that we kind of have a baseline definition of all these really important words um, and what they mean in communication studies, let's look at the different ways that intimacy plays out um, within different uh, uh, factors. So the first one we're going to look at is culture and co-culture. Um, and we talked, of course, about um, culture and co-culture in chapter one, in chapter three, uh, two, th through chapter one, three, and four, um, especially in four um, in our last chapter when we talked about wider social influences um, and how that impacts families. And so um, we have to remember then also that these uh, cultural expectations that we have um, and that are shared amongst family members, um, whether they come from external sources or internal sources are important to consider because they impact the expectations for and expressions of intimacy and closeness. What that means there in that red box on my lecture slide is that in any given culture that you're in, that culture um, may most likely impact the way that your family communicates their closeness to one another. Um, there's a lot of variability, a lot of change between cultures. And how cultures express intimacy and closeness varies a lot, um, mostly because culture also affects emotional expressiveness. Um, as you grow up in a particular culture, you may or may not be taught to be incredibly expressive about your emotions in one context and emotion not as emotional in another. So one example that I have for this kind of very abstract and concept thing to understand is this video and I really recommend that you watch it so that you can understand what I mean by it. So in this video, um, this uh, young, this son is talking about how um, his parents never really told him, I love you. They never said the words, I love you, but he never felt that he they didn't love him. Um, he figured out now as an adult that um, the way they checked in on him and said that I love you is they would ask, did you eat yet? Right. Um, and so that really tells us that culturally, particularly what we find um, as a pattern within uh, a majority of Asian cultures is that there is this um, cultural uh, practice of not verbally expressing your emotions very directly. For example, I um, uh, went to Japan for a summer and I found there that um, a lot of Japanese people that I met and befriended were very uncomfortable with expressing their emotions directly um, and that they would do it by performing tasks of think of gratitude for other people um, so instead of saying oh my gosh thank you so much I really appreciate you and, and I love and care for you so much as we would here in the United States they feel really uncomfortable saying that and expressing their uh, intimacy and emotions in that way so instead of saying that um, someone might actually do a task for you so they might um, come over and make dinner for you um, instead of saying thank you and so what I'm really getting at here is that culture will impact the way we express intimacy and that doesn't mean that intimacy isn't there it just means that as family scholars we have to be able to recognize and look for how intimacy is shared in different families in different ways because if you looked at it from for example an American lens in America we are encouraged to express our emotions verbally and we're encouraged to tell people that we care about them or that we're angry with them um, and we're encouraged to use our words a lot in that process and in other cultures and other families that may or may not be the case so we might look at those families as lacking in intimacy when in reality they're just expressing their intimacy in different ways and that also goes for co-cultures here in America a lot of my students for example um, will tell me that that um, in their families because um, uh, their parents grew up in a different country and immigrated here, um, their parents take a lot of um, their, their, uh, their, their immigrant countries cultural values and bring it here to the United States and so um, a lot of times my students will grow up being very Americanized right because they're um, uh, subject to American society and they're used to expressing their intimacy and their feelings for other people very directly where their parents might not actually be super comfortable with doing it and so even within a family you might have intergenerational differences in how intimacy is shared and my students had to 
learn how to understand that their parents are expressing their love and intimacy for them in a different way. And their parents had to learn um, that their own child expresses intimacy and love in a different way that they're used to from their culture. Um, and so you have to remember as well here that this is very important because while we might look for different cues of intimacy, um, remember that what cues you look for are culturally taught to you. And so it's important to think of other ways that people express intimacy amongst themselves that maybe we're not used to, right? Um, and so I love this video because it's a great example um, because the, um, the main character, the son right here, um, uh, uh, is talking to one of his friends who does be who is very verbally and directly intimate with his parents and says I love you to his parents um, and the son kind of is taken aback by that because he's never experienced that so the video is really him kind of self-reflecting on the different ways his fam his parents said I love you but in a different way right in a more indirect way because um, cultures aren't always super direct with the way that they express intimacy and as you self-reflect um, in your journals and on your discussion boards, you may find the case is the same for yourself as well, where maybe um, the American way um, of expressing intimacy might be something that you've really ingrained, but something that maybe your parents or other people in your family um, express intimacy differently. Um, and that's important to recognize, but be because communication um, is the vessel with which intimacy is communicated, we have to be able to recognize those different communication cues so that we do, we can tell when someone is trying to be intimate with us and show that they care about us in different ways. All right, so um, as we move on into learning how people express intimacy, um, one of the things we also have to remember is that biological sex and culture will also impact it as well. Um, I've talked about this in the past, so I won't um, dive super deep into it into this lecture, but um, as we've talked about before, um, as a society, we uh, we socially um, train or teach um, our boys and our girls at times to perform their genders in different ways. And so um, I use the word gender very purposefully because it's not the same as biological sex. But in generally speaking, um, we try to socially train boys to be less emotionally expressive, um, less emotionally intimate with other people. So it's not quote unquote appropriate or okay um, for boys to cry at a young age. They're discouraged from crying. Whereas for example, girls um, are encouraged to cry and express their emotions and it's okay quote unquote for girls to cry it's considered appropriate so that's just one example out of many um, of the ways that we um, are are taught all growing up how to perform our genders appropriately right um and so that will also affect our intimacy as well. As your book talks about and multitude of other researchers have found, um, females tend to actually then grow up um, being able to read nonverbal cues and read other people's emotions far better than males can. And it's not because males don't have that ability. It's because males were not socialized to have that ability at a young age, so they never got a chance to practice it, right? Um, and so... Uh, and males tend to um, think in a more linear way, gen very gen I'm speaking very generally right now, um, because of this socialization that males should not um, be emotional, should try to reduce, you know, being emotional. Um, and so it ends up having uh, long-term effects into adulthood as well. Um, and it doesn't have to be the case, but it's always important to recognize the way that our gender socialization creates um, individuals that express intimacy in different ways as well. Just as I discussed in my last slide, how culture can impact the way we express intimacy, so can um, our gender and our gender rules and our gender roles and values that we learn growing up. Um, Next up, meta emotions refers to the emotions people have about emotions. Um, and at any given time, if you really think about the emotions that you have, you very rarely just have one at a time, right? We're very rarely just angry. We're very rarely just sad. A lot of times we're feeling a mixture of anger, embarrassment, disappointment, um, hurt. Um, and we're feeling all of those. But really what manifests is one emotion at a time because um, at, at times it can be hard to manage those multitudes of emotions 
emotions that we might be feeling. And so when we are feeling negative emotions, particularly within our family and we're trying to express them, we might also be experiencing what we call meta emotions where we feel bad for feeling a certain way or good about a certain way. So these are the emotions that we have about our emotions. Sometimes, for example, and I'm sure perhaps this has happened to all of you at one point, um, you feel a certain way, but you um, resist or you're too afraid to express how you feel because you're worried about future consequences, right? Ooh, what if I say this? Will this person get mad at me? Will they be upset at me? Will this ruin our relationship? And all these thoughts are going on in your head. That's an example of a meta emotion where you're feeling a certain way even about expressing your feelings, right? Um, and it's important to recognize that because your meta emotions oftentimes have direct impacts in um, the the, first of all, your choice on whether or not you choose to express or share an emotion with someone. And secondly, it also impacts um, the quality of your relationships, right? Um, if you are not sharing your emotions with other people in an authentic way, um, it not only doesn't allow that other person to understand more about you, but it also doesn't help your own development with that person, right? As far as self-disclosure goes, which we'll talk about in just a second. So we're going to look at these key seven behaviors, um, and I think these are so important to understand and know. So these behaviors are are signs, right, are smoke signals of what makes up intimate relationships. So if you were a family scholar and you were studying a family, and you wanted to measure the level of intimacy, the level of closeness that that family has, you would look for these seven behaviors, right? You would look to see how many are present and to what extent and um, and how often they're displayed. Um, because while intimacy is very abstract, you can't see it, right? You can't see love, you can't see closeness. The only way we see it is through what it's maintained by, which is communication. So these are all communication cues, right? Communication behaviors that that then help us see as scholars or, or as researchers whether or not a family is um, intimate, right? And so the first one is declarations of commitment. And this is very straightforward. Um, this is saying things um, where you you prom make promises to other people. You say things like, I'm going to be there for you. Um, this at a heightened level is a marriage proposal, right? Um, this is when you verbally state, hey, I'm committed to you in X way, right? Um, whatever that may mean. And that usually is followed up with the second level, which is positive absolute statements. Things like, you are so amazing, and you are so great, and you are so awesome and kind, and you are so smart. And these absolute positive statements are statements that we share with others to try to encourage them most of the time. Um, oftentimes, my nephew, for example, when we're reading or we're practicing um, problem solving or we're playing with a puzzle, he may or may not get really frustrated, right? Um, and want to give up. And I have to give him these positive absolute statements where I say things like, you know what, you are so smart and I know you can figure this out. So the absoluteness, right, the in that statement gives him that confidence that there is no if for me as his aunt. I absolutely believe that he is smart and I absolutely believe that he can figure this puzzle or this issue out if he tries hard enough. And those statements are really important because it communicates this trust um, in the other person and it also makes my nephew um, or anyone that I use it with feel um, more close to me because it really is also a sign that I believe in them and I care about them. Um, Private language, um, <laughs> these are secrets and other things that we may share with people. And um, we talk a little bit about secrets in our uh, module for this week because I think it's important to think of the different ways that we may or may not share information with other people. Um, and it's important to realize the impact not only of sharing a secret with someone, but the impact of not sharing a secret with someone. And what that really means to us as a whole and what that tells us as family scholars um, um, because all of these signs kind of point to different levels of intimacy that we may or may not have um, in a given relationship. And actually, I would like to point out um, to you in page 181 of your textbook, there's a fantastic example of private language um, that uh, Hopper and Knapp kind of talk about. Um, 
They say, quote, ordinary words may have transformed private meanings within families, things like nicknames. Um, so it's not only just in the realm of secrets, but things like nicknames, things like um, uh, inside jokes, um, things that only really you and that person or your family could really understand. Um, so for example, if I visited your family, private language would involve any inside jokes or comments or nicknames that I wouldn't really have um, an understanding of. Um, and that's really important to recognize because it solidifies the um, relational bonds between all of the family members when they're able to share um, a special nickname or a special term for something that other people um, can't uh, can't copy, right? That outside people, that people outside of the family can't just join in on. Another example they also give in the textbook is um, the language that twins kind of create with one another and this um, different level of intimacy that twins may or may not have with one another and they create what we call twin speak, right? Where um, twins create their own language, literally, that even other members in their own family can't follow. And that really says a lot about their level of intimacy um, that they have with one another as a result of it. Um, then we have a uh, language of comfort and support, of course, very um, straightforward and messages of comfort and support are um, I, are distinguished from positive absolute statements for a reason. I know that students sometimes tend to confuse those. Just remember that positive absolute statements are um, statements where you confirm um, the absoluteness, your your sureness, how uh, your 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 ability of, to be so confident in someone else. Whereas um, messages of comfort and support um, really uh, involve more when you need help and when you need assistance with problems or issues that are you going on, that are going on in your life, you go to your family for um, statements of comfort and support. Um, and so it's important to remember that because um, there may or may not, uh, it's a, first I want to make a point that it's beautiful that you have, you know, people in your family that can give you those statements of comfort and support. However, um, as your textbook notes, sometimes it's not always incredibly productive for you to go to your family for um, support because the downside is, is that families might become too close to a problem. Um, they might not have... Um, uh, the ob the emotional objectivity um, in order to give you the right advice that you need, right? Um, particularly, for, of course, uh, for example, your parents. Your parents care about you so much, um, and so any advice you may seek from them will come from their parental lens, right? So the textbook, I think, does a great job of noting how that's different um, from positive absolute statements that just say, hey, I believe in you, I know you're this, I know you're smart, I know you're that, um, versus comfort and support, which um, has its positives and also has its downsides, right? Um, when you seek advice from someone who has been in your life for a very long time, it is quite understandable that they may or may not always be absolutely objective about the advice that they give you. Um, for example, a student shared with me once that she was very much emotionally torn with um, uh, uh, transferring to a four-year university that was farther away from home than she would have liked but she really wanted to go to this university and she truly never thought in her wildest dreams that she would get in but she was accepted and it's a very prestigious um, university and she was very excited and so she spoke to her mother about um, going to this university and how conflicted she was, but she was really seeking this comfort and support from her mother. Um, and at the end of the day, um, her mother actually advised her to not take uh, go to that university because her mother said, well, if you go so far away, um, you probably won't be successful in school because you'll need our support to help you, right? Um, which is true to a certain extent, but um, the student shared with me how hurt she was that um, her mother was uh, uh, focused at times on trying to keep her close to the family more for her own personal needs, not for the dreams and desires that my student had. So again, that's one example of a multitude of different dimensions, how support can play out in not a productive way. But of course, support and comfort plays out in a multitude of positive ways. Um, a lot of you have already shared on how how important different family members have been in your life and, and the things that done, they've done and said to support you. Um, and uh, that's not also to be... Um, disregarded, but the book and I are both kind of encouraging you to look at um, statements of comfort and support um, in, a, in a dialectical way. This is foreshadowing to our next part of our lecture um, so that we can understand um, 
how intimacy plays out when people are seeking advice um, and comfort and support from one another. Then we have playfulness. Of course, this is just teasing, um, being able to make fun of each other and being able to be open with each other in this way. We find that couples that have this playfulness tend to have higher dimensions of trust, which is interesting as well. Um, that correlation uh, uh, tends to um, be quite common in different studies about uh, uh, couples. Um, Moving on, nonverbal intimacy and sexuality. Nonverbal intimacy deals with the idea that you're able to be physically close to someone, right? Hold their hand, give them hugs, um, be comfortable next to them, um, uh, being close to them with your body. Um, and of course, that not only goes for romantic couples, that goes for any type of relationship, right? You want to be able to feel comfortable hanging out with your siblings and with your parents, right? And you would sit with them at a much closer um, distance than you would someone else that you don't know. And that really communicates how comfortable you are with your family. Um, they also, the book also discusses nonverbal sexuality as well, and it's incredibly important for romantic partners to have that nonverbal intimacy and sexuality expressed. Um, but it's important that just because there's sexual behavior in a relationship, that doesn't mean that there's intimacy. Um, so the sexual behavior itself has to um, involve intimacy, right? Has to involve closeness, um, because just sexual behavior itself is not intimacy in and of itself um, to make that clear so um, sexual behavior when it is performed between couples in a loving and, and trusting and, cons and a way with consent um, is intimate um, otherwise uh, just because sex is present that doesn't mean that couples are intimate um, in the dimensions as we've talked about with the definition of intimate. Um, and lastly, self-disclosure, very important thing to think about. And self-disclosure really refers to the idea that um, you can share things with other people that they could not easily find out any other way. Um, information that you would not just readily have out there on your social media or have out there um, in public for people to know about. Um, this is what self-disclosure is about, is sharing that very private, very personal information um, with people. And self-disclosure, when done at the appropriate time and done in the appropriate context, really develops closeness between relationships, as it should, right? Um, think of, for example, when you go on a date with someone, um, if you like them and you continue dating, over time, um, you'll share very close details about yourself with them and they will share with you. And that exchange of self-disclosure really bonds you further in your relationship because you just learn so much more about them and understand more about them through that self-disclosure. All right, so as I talked about, with uh, my last slide trying to preview the dialectical approach a little bit. Um, and so the dialectic approach, actually, if this seems familiar to you, is from chapter two, as I talked about um, at the front part of this lecture. It's a really awesome way of looking at um, the various tensions that come along with um, any given relationship. So if you would like to go back and look at those um, dimensions um, in our chapter two lecture, I really encourage that you do. Um, I explain them in my chapter two video lecture as well because you really have to understand uh, the need for autonomy, which is independence, and closeness, and how those are constant um, tensions, this tug and pull that anyone in a family has to deal with. Um, uh, and so uh, that's introduced to us in chapter two. The same idea is built up here in chapter five. Um, so if you are having a really hard time approaching this in chapter five, I really recommend kind of hitting the pause button a little bit and going back to chapter two and looking at my video lecture on these dialectic uh, tensions um, so that you have a bigger foundation for understanding um, what we're doing here with this theory in chapter five. And so um, your book kind of shows you this progression into uh, the dialectic approach. I'm not going to um, dive super deep into this today, but really what I did here, um, as you can see through my mouse, um, I just layered uh, the different types of thinking um, as they're presented in the textbook, but also as I think in a way that kind of makes sense to understanding them. Um, and so the first type of thinking that helps us understand the value of dialectic thinking is monolithic, monologic, sorry. So monologic thinking is this perspective that um, intimacy is linear, that I could measure um, the start and end of your relationship and that over time you will get more and more intimate with these people or these persons that are your family, right? Um, and it really focuses on um, increasing in positive um, ways that intimacy can be developed. But it's very limited, right? Because as we've already learned in our other 
chapters, um, relationships, especially among family members, are messy and very rarely are they super linear and easy to track from the start of my relationship with this person to now, right? It's so much more complex than that. Um, sometimes family members get estranged from each other and don't talk to each other for a very long time. Sometimes family members are intimate in different contexts. And so monologic thinking doesn't really account for that. And it also doesn't account for... Um, the ways in which people strive for separateness and autonomy and how that actually can promote intimacy in different ways. Um, and so now we're going to move on to dualistic thinking, which tries to take that into account. It builds on monologic thinking by saying that it's not linear. It's about how you recognize the different ways that staying apart actually might make you more intimate. So for example, um, a, a couple, uh, a couple uh, might uh, feel more and more intimate with one another when they're able to have separate time and separate spaces um, every now and then um, and, and get that sense of autonomy. Um, because again, like I said in chapter two, all relationships require a certain level of autonomy or independence um, and all of them also require a certain level of closeness and the people in those relationships have to negotiate those tensions in a way that fits them, right? There's no really one right answer to that. Um, and as we've talked about in our previous chapters as well, um, we've theorized of the different ways that um, couples might want different levels of intimacy or autonomy, right? Some couples really love being super interconnected. Some couples really love being independent and having their own space, but still being a couple. And dualistic thinking takes that into account. It takes into account how being separate sometimes can actually promote your connection to the other person. Um, but it also doesn't really help us fully understand how to negotiate those tensions, which is where we get to the last level, which is dialectic thinking. Dialectic Dialectic thinking really takes monologic and dualistic link thinking, puts them together, and helps us to recognize that people are messy, relationships are messy, and there's a complex nature um, of discussing separateness and connectedness in the family. And that wanting to be separate and wanting to be connected actually operate at the same time um, in a family. And let's go ahead and build on this idea right now. So, um, as I talked about before, dialectical tensions were mentioned to you in chapter two. I won't review them here um, because I kind of want to make sure that I focus on the new stuff we're learning in this chapter. Um, but one of the big pieces of dialectical tensions that we uh, study in this chapter is this idea of wanting to be connected and wanting to be independent. How do we do that? How do we manage that? Um, every uh, individual in a family member has to manage it with all their other family members, but how do they do that? So one of the ways that they do that is what we call through cyclic alteration. This is when you alternate um, oppositions. Um, oftentimes you'll find people say things like, okay, this week um, I would really like to um, have my own space and do my own thing, but next week, um, why don't we spend that weekend together all day at Disneyland, right? Um, couples do that a lot where they alternate one week or another, one week of being super separate from one another, having their own space, and one week of being very, very connected. And this works sometimes. Um, Segmentation is when you isolate opposites in different contexts. I know that when you read cyclic alternate alteration and segmentation, it sounds very familiar. They sound very similar to one another, and they do. Um, the biggest difference is that segmentation involves changing of context, right? Um, so for example, I might really need a lot of independence at work. Um, but I really like to have my life um, uh, a lot more connected to my significant other in different contexts. So for example, when I do things at work and I have work events or anything related to my work, I want my significant other to give me my independence and give me my space. But in the context of family stuff, I want my significant other to always be there at fa at Thanksgiving or holiday gatherings or things like that, right? Um, I want them there and I want that connection with them when it relates to family things, but I really want my own space when it relates to work things. So that's a change of context, right? Whereas cyclic alteration is a change of time, right? One week I wanna be close, one week I don't wanna be close, right? Um, selection is when you select one need and you ignore the other. A lot of um, people use this as kind of like a quick band-aid, quick fix when they need to manage tensions um, because no doubt the struggle between being connected and being independent results in a lot of conflict between people. Um, and so this is when you um, 
decide you know what we're just going to focus on my needs or your needs um, and not really service the needs of another person Um, and sometimes this helps because it helps kind of like I said have a band-aid if you've had a really long fight with someone this is a great kind of compromise step to get to but of course it's not um something that uh, is long term then we have disqualifying this is when you just ignore one of the tensions altogether you just say that it's not even worth my time Um, in selection you note that the other person's feelings are valid you just decide well we're going to prioritize my feelings you know this week instead of yours disqualifying is when you just disqualify or or render um, their uh, feelings about the tension as not um valid um then we have reframing this is when you try to redefine opposition so a lot of couples for example might initially have issues with trust um um issues with for example having a passcode on your phone like will you let me have the passcode to your phone um yes or no and so it's about uh, how much privacy do i have in this relationship how much openness do we need to have in this relationship right this tension and so some couples may choose to reframe that by saying hey um, I want you to trust me um, uh, by not requesting my passcode of me but trusting me enough so where you don't even you you don't even feel like you need the passcode so that's a way of trying to redefine it um, instead of either an option of you either give me your passcode or you don't right to show that I can trust you some couples may reframe it by saying hey um, why why don't we think about this as if I don't have to give you my passcode that really shows how strong we are as a couple right the, that that um, you don't even need to have it in order to trust me so some couples might reframe in that way and neutralizing is when you both try to sacrifice something um, unlike in selection where you select one need over the other neutralizing is when you compromise and you both give up something in order to try to figure out a nice middle ground for your attentions um, So these are the ways we manage our tensions. Let's move on to different theories. Um, So now that we talked about one theory of intimacy, which is dialectics, but let's move on to attachment theory. This is new. This is awesome. Um, And it really tells us a big thing. It tells us that um, how we respond to our caregiver as a child and the relationship we have with our caregiver as a child will impact the type of relationship we have um, as an adult, which is crazy to think about, right? Um, So it's a really awesome theory to help us reflect on our childhood and how it may or may not have impacted um, how we look at relationships now in our adulthood and and how we treat our relationships now. And so what I did here was I kind of distilled um, the different types of relationships when you are a child and your caregiver and of course for intents and purposes of our class caregiver here refers to whoever took care of you so that could be your parents it could be your grandma grandpa whoever primarily took care of you as a child um and then attachment styles for adults what that means and so we find that for example um a secure relationship between the child and the caregiver means that you have a confident infant right a confident child and a responsive caregiver you get a child that doesn't get super anxious about the caregiver leaving the room. Um, You get a child that doesn't always need the caregiver there with them, right? Um, These are children, for example, that when they first go to kindergarten on the first day, um, they feel confident um, about you know, leaving their parents for the day and they feel confident that their parents will come back to pick them up. Not all children feel this way. On the very first day, you might get children that cry a lot on their first day of kindergarten and are very terrified, right? And and that they want to stay with their parent or their caretaker instead of going to school. Um, and so this secureness is a really healthy look at relationships between child and caregiver. Then we have anxious and ambivalent. This is a temperamental infant with an inconsistent caregiver. Usually this means that the caregiver isn't always responsive. They're not consistent. They're not always there. Um, so you end up with someone, a, a child, um, that is very temperamental, that sometimes maybe have issues with um, being able to control their emotions or express their emotions. Um, you might find this, for example, in a... Uh, uh, families with divorced children and one of the parents isn't always consistently there for the child and so um 
if the child, for example, expects um, their parent to visit them or pick them up or hang out with them for a weekend and the parent doesn't show up um, or shows up late or shows up om- only every now and then, that inconsistency will lead to, according to the attachment theory, will lead to the child being very temperamental um, a- as a result. Um, and then we have avoidant. We end up with an undemonstrative infant and caregiver. Undemonstrative, undemonstrative here refers to the idea that you get um, both infant and caregiver that are not emotionally expressive, that don't have high emotional intelligence, that aren't really capable of negotiating intimacy, um, building relationships, and they just don't have familiarity with that. Typically, this is because um, unlike the anxious and ambivalent where you might still have the caregiver coming and going, right, and still present, usually avoidant means that the caregiver is not present at all, right, Um, or very little. Or if they are present, they're not emotionally and intimately present with the child. Um, And so ultimately that results into what you might get here as an adult. You can see these four categories. You'll get a secure person. Um, This of course means that you were were in a secure relationship um, with your caregiver as a child. So you get someone that's comfortable with both autonomy and intimacy. This really relates to dialectics because it helps us understand the success of someone being able to negotiate the tension between being independent and connected with someone. Um, Usually secure people are very good with that. They're comfortable with, for example, their significant other going on a week-long trip really far away, and they're comfortable with their caregiver living with them and being with them all the time. They're comfortable with both extremes, and they're able to negotiate both of those extremes, right? Um, Whereas uh, you might... Um, If you're anxious and ambivalent, get two different kinds. You might get preoccupied or dismissing. You might get someone who's super obsessed with being intimate. Someone who wants to be with their um, family or their significant other all the time. Or you might get someone who's dismissive, who doesn't care about intimacy and who doesn't see it as important. You might get these two extremes because of the anxious and ambivalent. Um, And you might also, as a result of the avoidant um, relationship, you might as an adult get the fearful. Um, Usually this is because, as I said before, you get um, a, a child and a caregiver that don't really interact, a caregiver that is just not there at all. And so the infant may not get practice, right, that practice time needed with creating relationships with someone else, with sharing their emotions, with having social skills. And so they end up being an adult that's very fearful of intimacy as a result. This is an awesome theory. I love it. And I think it says so much about um, holistically our whole um, lives. And uh, it's just really cool to think about. Now let's go into social exchange theory. Social exchange is a very economic um, theory. You're going to hear me refer to it as an economic-based theory often, and so will your textbook. Um, And so this theory basically says is that um, whether or not you decide to stay or leave a relationship um, uh, is based off the rewards minus the cost of the relationship. Every relationship has a reward. Every relationship has a cost and you, according to this theory, will decide to stay or go in the relationship, break up or get together um, based off um, the, uh, the, the rewards minus the cost. Ultimately, the rewards have to outweigh the cost to a certain amount, right? Um, and so it sounds very superficial, but it's much more complex than we think it is. It really helps us understand um, how people um, interpret their relationships, how they choose to stay in certain relationships, and it helps us a lot. Um, and what do we use in order to decide, are we going to stay or go? We use two things. We use our comparison level and comparison level for our alternatives. So let me go through these, and then I'll give an example. Um, comparison level is um, what a person feels they should expect regarding costs and rewards from a relationship. So if you get into a relationship expecting, for example, that um, you're going to get a lot of autonomy and a lot of independence, but yet the other person really wants a lot of intimacy from you, you're going to feel like, Ugh, is it worth it for me at this point, right, to try to negotiate all of these tensions um, or should I just go? Right. Um, Because for you right now, the cost of that relationship is someone who really wants to be intimate and close all the time. And you're someone who might want a lot more independence Um, to use uh, an example that is not related to dialectics. uh, Let me give you another example. Sorry, guys, I got to drink a lot of water while I'm lecturing because I keep my voice good. Um, So. Another example of comparison level might be you might really walk into a relationship 
expecting someone that is always there for you, um, that um, is supportive of you and helpful. And maybe you might get someone who isn't supportive of you or who challenges you in a lot of ways that you don't feel are productive you'll leave according to social exchange theory. So comparison level simply means you as a person, as an individual, have a baseline minimum qualification, right? You think no matter what in any given relationship, I should at least get this. And if I'm not getting this, right, whatever this baseline qualifier of that person is, then I should leave because now that's not a reward for me anymore, right? Um, so for example, um, in in my relationship, what I really wanted when I was uh, uh, seeking relationship was I really wanted someone who supported um, my career, um, who, who wanted me to put my career first, and also someone who had a love of dogs just like me, um, who had similar interests as me. And that was my baseline level of what I wanted. Um, and so I sought that out because um, I felt that if I didn't have that baseline comparison level, the cost of the relationship would be too much for me um, as opposed to rewards. I wouldn't get enough rewards to make the cost of the relationship worth it. Does that make sense? Um, so um, now we might also use a comparison level of alternatives where we um, evaluate the relationship based off what we can expect from another relationship. So for example, you might compare um, your current relationship to a past one. So not just your baseline level, but your past relationship. Um, you might go out and ask a friend and say, hey, my significant other won't give me the passcode to their their cell phone. Is that how your relationship is? And you might seek advice from someone else, right? And see what their relationship is like. And you'll use their relationship as a comparison level for yours, right? Which we often do that. Um, so you already know all this stuff. You're just now putting a name to it. And so really what this does is help us understand um, the worth of a relationship for us. And like I said before, it seems very superficial, but it helps us. And let me give you an example of how it helps us on a deeper level. Um, so when we look at abusive domestic relationships, right? Um, relationships where women, for example, are domestically abused, um, either verbally or physically or sexually. Um, we often, as outsiders, might wonder, oh, why doesn't she just leave him, right? It's just so easy. And it's not that easy. Because if we use social exchange theory to help us understand that phenomenon, the reason these women aren't leaving usually um, is because they still have some sense of reward in the relationship. Even though the cost in the relationship is getting abused, the reward might be access to their children. Oftentimes, um, people who, uh, 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 who abuse others, and, and we find that usually um, uh, men who abuse women in domestic relationships will withhold access to the children as a way to make the woman stay. They'll also withhold access to money. They'll withhold access to education. They will hold access to a lot of things and say, hey, I won't let you, um, you know, get into our joint bank account or see our kids if you leave me. And so as uh, these women choose to stay because the reward for them even though the cost seems very high to us, the reward for them is still worth it, right? Being able to be with their children is worth the abuse that they get. Um, so social exchange theory really helps us understand how people make these really tough decisions on whether or not they choose to stay or go in a relationship. And so for us on the outside, it seems really simple for us to say like, oh, she should just leave this man who's, you know, domestically abusing her. But social exchange theory would step in and tell us that it's not that easy, right? That there's a lot of other moving factors and there might be other rewards for her out there um, that uh, that that compel her to stay in the relationship. Even to us, the cost might seem too much. Um, and of course, I have an example, another example right here for you if you would like to see it. Moving on, we have what we call the circumplex model. I won't cover it super in depth, but I just like the idea of it. There's a lot of 25 dimensions here, and I don't want you to have to memorize those. I really just want you to understand the gist of the theory, which is that family life is about adaptability and cohesion and how much balance you have between those two things. Um, and so adaptability is your family's uh, ability to deal with stress, right? All families will deal with stress no matter what in their lives. Um, and it also deals with your family's ability to be emotionally connected, stay cohesive, stay strong in any family experience, both positive and negative. And so what we want are um, families that are able to do both in a balanced way. 
An example I have here um, is a professor who's trying to teach his class about um, time management and about how you have to kind of figure out ways to adapt to stress and be cohesive with your life. And I love this video because I think it's a great example of what the circumplex model seeks for. It seeks that sense of balance um, within us. So. With that being said, that is our chapter five lecture. So today we've learned about um, a couple of major things. We've learned about intimacy. We've learned about how communication um, uh, uh, is a key in um, communicating intimacy, creating intimacy and maintaining intimacy. We've learned about how culture and gender impact the way we express intimacy. And we've also learned three major theories, social, social exchange theory, dialectic theory, um, uh, so, uh, attachment theory as well as a circumplex model for ways of looking at how families deal with intimacy, seek balance in intimacy, um, and understand and express their intimacy. So I hope this um, lecture was helpful for you. I'm always of course open to any questions. I know some of these theories are very complex and they have a lot of principles and they posit a lot of things and they um, presume a lot of things. So if you have any questions, shoot me a message and I'm always happy to give you more examples and more help. See you all next lecture. Bye!